think I've done it. But it's the second greatest story ever told. So without any further ado, let's get started. And before we go to John Paul II, first we need to go to his country, Poland, get some context, because we're not going to really understand Blessed John Paul II without understanding Poland, because he's tied in with the amazing story that Poland is. Okay, so we'll start with the story of Poland. Poland has one of the most amazing stories, I think, of any country in Europe, maybe in any country in the world. I'm a bit of a history buff, and I lived in Poland. I'm not Polish, but I lived in Poland. I studied the language and uh, the history and culture for about a year, and uh, I want to share with you a couple of the highlights of what I learned. Probably the, the biggest highlight, the biggest point of what I learned about Polish history is that God has seemed to use Poland several times in world history to save Europe. I'll give you a couple examples of that. First, 1683. In 1683, there was an army of over more than 200,000 Muslim Turks who were wanting to invade Europe. And they were going to start with the city of Vienna, which is at the outskirts of Europe. And they attacked the city. They said, people who looked at the attack and the bombardment against the city walls by the Turks, they said it looked like it was, it was winter during the summer because there was all of these white tents surrounding the city. It looked like snow on the ground. These were all the tents of the, of the Muslim Turks. And the kings and the princes of Europe were bickering among themselves and they wouldn't go to help Vienna. And the Vienna was shooting out arrows with messages saying, we've only got five days left, the walls are crumbling, we can't hold much longer. And nobody was coming to their aid, except one king. It was King Jan Sobieski of Poland. It wasn't politically expedient for him to do so, but he chose to go and rescue Vienna, or at least to try. And he and his Polish cavalry, they went, they had a lot of courage, a couple of the other princes helped them out, but he went to Vienna and they attacked the commander's tent that was just outside the walls, went right through the tent, killed the commander, and sent that whole 200,000-man army fleeing back to the Ottoman Empire. And Vienna was saved, thanks to King Jan Sobieski. So that's one instance. They say, the historians say that if it were not for Jan, King Jan Sobieski and his Polish cavalry, they would have probably conquered and gone on to conquer the rest of Europe. So that's one instance. Let's take another one, 1920. Something called the Miracle on the Vistula, which is an important river in Poland. This was 1920. This is shortly after the end of World War I. World War I ended in 1918. The end of World War I. The armies of Europe, in fact, all the countries of Europe, were totally exhausted by that all-out war. Right there, Europe is flat on its backs. All the armies, all of the people are totally exhausted, except for one army, which was a million-man army in Russia that was fired up because of the Bolshevik Revolution. It was a million-man army of peasants. And they were so fired up with the communist ideals that had been preached to them through by reading Marx and Lenin, and they were fired up, and they were going to go and conquer all of Europe for the Marxist ideals for communism. All they had to do was pass through the bridge in from Eastern Europe into Western Europe, and that bridge at the heart of Europe was Poland. And as this million-man army is going through Poland, there was this courageous marshal, Marshal Joseph Pilsudski, and he led an army of Poles, this ragtag army that was nothing compared to this million-man army of Russians. They attacked the Russian army, split them in half, and miraculously defeated them and sent them running back to Russia. And then the historians say if it weren't for Marshal Pilsudski and the, that Polish army, that million-man army would have won the day easily throughout the rest of Europe, and all of Europe in 1920 would have become communist. But it was thanks again where God seemed to use Poland to save Europe, save the world in a sense. Okay, now let's fast forward a little bit further. 1989. What happened in 1989? There's kind of an iconic picture or a scene that had to place 1989. It was the fall of the Berlin Wall, right? That was the start of the fall of communism, right? Wrong! <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't in Berlin. It didn't start there. Rather, it started in the Gdansk shipyards of Poland with the Solidarity Movement that was inspired and supported in many ways by Pope John Paul II with Lech Walesa and was receiving his strength and encouragement from Pope John Paul II. And it was this labor union in Poland, the Solidarity Labor Union, that brought communism down in Poland and it started a domino effect to all these other communist satellite states 
and then we see it on the news in 1989 with the fall of Berlin Wall, but it started there again in Poland. Again, God seemed to be using this little country in Poland. Now, of all of the stories of Polish history, there's a lot of amazing, miraculous ones, and I think part of the reason God liked to use Poland is because Poland was a country of deep, deep faith, deep Catholic faith, but also it was a country that suffered a lot. And oftentimes God used suffering servants to accomplish his works. And he was using Poland in all these instances, but I think the best part of Polish history, the best story of it all, took place on the eve of some of the worst destruction, the worst bloodshed, the worst terror, the worst horror in the history of the world, at least in the sense of militarily speaking. World War II. On the eve of World War II, before all of this bloodshed, as the build-up to the war was taking place, Jesus appeared to this little nun in Poland named Sister Faustina Kowalska, and he revealed to her the message of his merciful love, the modern message of divine mercy. Now that message of divine mercy goes back to the first greatest story ever told, right? It's part of sacred scripture. In fact, as Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict would say, divine mercy gets to the very heart, the very core of sacred scripture. But Jesus appearing to St. Faustina before World War II was emphasizing the message of his mercy because he knew what was coming. He wanted to prepare the world for all of the atrocities, all of the evil that was to take place in the 20th century and beyond. John Paul II would say in some ways our time, which is marked by so many blessings, is also marked in some ways by unprecedented evil. And God in his goodness through St. Faustina was saying that evil does not have the last word that God is not outdone by evil. And as St. Paul says in Romans 5.20, where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more. So in a time of unprecedented evil, God was saying, I want to give unprecedented grace. And he used the prophetic witness of St. Faustina to announce that to the church, that the power of mercy can overcome all evil and not only conquer evil, but bring even good out of evil. And that was the message that Jesus gave to St. Faustina. He, had, he also asked her to have an image painted, a chaplet of divine mercy, a whole devotion of divine mercy. But the heart of it was this message of mercy, is that mercy is a particular mode of love when it encounters poverty, brokenness, weakness, sin. Mercy is love when it encounters suffering. And Jesus was revealing this consoling message to the world on the eve of some of the worst suffering in the history of the world. Now, during World War II, and as World War II raged in the aftermath with all of the suffering in Europe, this message of divine mercy began to spread like wildfire. People loved the message. It was deeply consoling to them. They would have that image of divine mercy, and in the midst of their suffering, they would say, Jesus, I trust in you. And they would experience the, the rays of his merciful love embracing them. And the people in Europe, in post-war torn Europe, loved this message, and it was spreading like crazy. Now the only problem was, some of the bishops were hearing about this message of divine mercy, that there was this, this Polish mystic behind it, and they wanted to see, is this genuine? As they rightfully should have a right to do. Is this genuine? Is Jesus really speaking to this person? And so they gathered together a lot of the documentation, a lot of the pamphlets and prayers and things that had been circulating in war-torn Europe. And these bishops sent all of these documents to Rome and they asked the Vatican congregation to say, what's the decision on this? Is this authentic or not? Should we promote it in our diocese or not? And the, and the Vatican congregation took these documents. There were some bad translations of what was in the diary of Faustina and the message. And the Vatican was saying, well, we can't tell if Faustina is speaking or Jesus is speaking. So they put a ban on the message of divine mercy. They put a ban on it. And a lot of people were very disappointed. My congregation, the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, we were spreading it in the United States. And when the ban came out, we took all of the materials and buried it in the back to be obedient to the decision of the church. But people were really disappointed because this was a message that was deeply consoling to them. And there was one bishop 
who had read some of the documentation on St. Faustina and he thought this is authentic and maybe the Vatican needs more documentation to make a better decision, a better judgment. Maybe they didn't have all the data. And so this bishop gathered together more information, more documentation, and he did all of this behind the scenes work, sent it to Rome. When Rome got this documentation, they went through it. They said, oh, okay, we see. Okay, now this is a better translation. We see what she's saying. This is a good stuff. And they lifted the ban on the message of divine mercy. Well, six months after the ban was lifted, the bishop who was doing all of that work behind the scenes was elected Pope John Paul II. Now, when Pope John Paul II, when Carol Wojtyla was his name, when he became Pope John Paul II, he forgot all about the message of divine mercy, right? Right? Wrong! <laughs> Wrong again, right? No, he did not forget about the message of divine mercy. In fact, his second encyclical letter was dedicated entirely to divine mercy. You know, these popes write encyclical letters, these important documents that come from Rome. His second one was on divine mercy. It was called Divus and Misericordia, rich in mercy. And John Paul said he had had St. Faustina on his mind for a very long time before he wrote that letter. And in that letter, it's this eloquent, message of how important the message of divine mercy is for our modern time. He wrote that encyclical letter in 1980. In 1981, he visited a shrine to divine mercy in Covalenza, Italy. And while he was there at that shrine, he said, he made a statement. I'm going to read it here for him. Yeah, here we go. This is the statement he made of the shrine of divine mercy in Italy. Right from the beginning of my ministry in St. Peter's See in Rome, I considered this message of divine mercy my special task. Providence has assigned it to me in the present situation of man, the church, and the world. It could be said that precisely this situation of the modern world and its suffering assigned that message to me as my task before God. John Paul II saw this message of divine mercy as his task before God. Now, then throughout his pontificate, he continued to speak about it. He beatified St. Faustina. He would speak more and more frequently about how the importance of the message of divine mercy, how much the world needs to understand and trust in the divine mercy, in Jesus Christ or divine mercy. And then, but we'll fast forward to some a really extraordinary event. In the year 2000, he canonized, he declared a saint, Sister Faustina Kowalska. And in that canonization ceremony in the year 2000, which was the first, you know, she was the first saint of the Jubilee year, he said two things in his homily that totally knocked my socks off. The first thing, it knocked the first sock off, was he said, by this act of canonization, of declaring Faustina a saint, I intend to pass this message of divine mercy on to the third millennium. I was like, oh, this is awesome. I remember watching it on TV. The second thing, he said, and also, I don't remember his exact words, but he basically said, and now, henceforth, in, for the Universal Church, the second Sunday of Easter will be known as Divine Mercy Sunday. And I was doing flips in my room when I heard that because I remembered in the diary of St. Faustina, Jesus had said, I want this feast of divine mercy celebrated in the church. And Faustina had went to some priests and theologians and said, Jesus wants this feast celebrated. And they said, well, but there already is such a feast because there was a feast of mercy in the early church and then it had been forgotten over the centuries. And they said, there already is such a feast. So Faustina went back to Jesus. She said, Jesus, I talked to the priests and theologians. They said, there already is such a feast. And Jesus said to her, and who knows about it? <laughs> so John Paul II declared that feast, which is a great, we can imagine a great consolation to the life of the heart of Jesus, but it was also a delight to John Paul II because there was a banquet after the canonization ceremony that John Paul attended. And some of the priests in my community also attended that banquet. And one of them told me, that to all the guests present, at one point in the banquet, John Paul said, and he announced, today is the happiest day of my life. John Paul II, I mean, did he have a lot of accomplishments in his life? Oh yeah. But he said, today is the happiest day of my life. Why? Because he understood that the only hope for modern world, for modern humanity, is divine mercy. 
is to call on divine mercy, to trust in divine mercy, to live divine mercy. And he was, he was fulfilling his mission, his special task before God. And it brought him great joy. When you fulfill a mission or a task, it brings you joy, right? Amen? Yeah, okay. Now, the thing was, is after that, I thought, okay, hot dog, that's enough. We've got the Feast of Divine Mercy, St. Faustina, we're all set. This is awesome. But John Paul didn't stop. He kept going. In the year 2002, he visited the Shrine of Divine Mercy. Actually, he went to dedicate the Shrine of Divine Mercy in Krakow, Wabigniki in Poland. And while he was dedicating that shrine, he gave first, I'm going to read part of what he said. Pope Benedict XVI said that this statement of his actually summarizes his whole pontificate. But one interesting thing that he's going to mention in this homily, I should just tell you really quick. Remember I was telling you that Poland has a special role in, in world history sometimes. Well, there's one passage in the Diary of St. Faustina that had always made me a little nervous. I thought, I don't know what to make of this. I want to read that passage for a second. Jesus says to Faustina, I bear a special love for Poland, and if she will be obedient to my will, I will exalt her in might and holiness. From her will come forth the spark that will prepare the world for my final coming. I, yeah, that was my reaction. I'm like, okay, hello. You know, I'm not sure about that. All right, this apocalyptic stuff sort of scared me. I read through it. But listen to what John Paul II said in 2002 when he dedicated that Shrine of Mercy in Krakow. These are his words. He says, Today, therefore, in this shrine, I wish solemnly to entrust the world to divine mercy. I do so with the burning desire that the message of God's merciful love proclaimed here through St. Faustina may be made known to all the peoples of the earth and fill their hearts with hope. May this message radiate from this place to our beloved homeland, Poland, and throughout the world. May the binding promise of the Lord Jesus be fulfilled. The binding promise. From here, there must go forth the spark that will prepare the world for the Lord's final coming. This spark needs to be lighted by the grace of God. This fire of mercy needs to be passed on to the world. In the mercy of God, the world will find peace and mankind will find happiness. Pretty strong words from the Pope, eh? Amen or oh my, right? <laughs> Pretty strong. Well, something that's amazing to me about this passage is well, first of all, do we know the day or the hour when the Lord is coming? No, we do not. Jesus himself tells us that in Scripture, right? We don't know the day or the hour of the Lord's coming. But what's interesting is what John Paul II is saying here, and Pope Benedict reiterated later, is that the way we prepare for the Lord's coming is not with fear and trembling and freaking out, but with trust in God's mercy, trusting in divine mercy, trusting in that power of love in the midst of suffering clinging to divine mercy. Now, when I heard that, when I read that homily, I thought, now this is this is amazing. This, I thought this was about as great as it could get. It wasn't. It got even better. And it was important that it got better, and here's why. Believe it or not, there is a lot of critics of Blessed John Paul II's emphasis on divine mercy. They would say, oh, that's just a Polish devotion. That's just John Paul II's Polish kick. And they thought it was just, you know, sort of his own little thing. But God did something to sort of put the, put the uh, exclamation point on the importance of this message. And the way he did it was, let me give you a preface real quick, a quick story. When I was in the seminary, I had studied a lot of the thought of John Paul II. He was my hero. I did my master's thesis on an aspect of his thought. I read everything that he wrote in English. I eventually studied Polish so I could read some of in the original language. I just loved John Paul II. And being, I'm sort of a melancholic temperament, and sometimes I would get a little bit um, depressed or worried because I would think about the life of blessed John Paul II back when I was in the seminary. I thought, this is such a beautiful life. This is such an amazing life. It's such an amazing story that I would say, Lord, if he just sort of dies of, of a heart attack in the bathtub or something, I'm going to be so disappointed. <laughs> Bizarre, yes, that's Father Mike. But the idea was, was that I was like, there needs to be a fitting end to such an amazing life. And I thought, there can't be a fitting end to this amazing life. So I'm already disappointed. 
Okay, yeah, I know. That's why it took me 15 years in the seminary, folks. All right. But then something happened on April 2nd, 2005. John Paul II died on April 2nd, 2005. Wait a minute. That was the day before Divine Mercy Sunday. Ah, shucks. If he would have just held out one more day, right? Oh, he was so close. It would have been the best story ever, right? Wrong again. <laughs> Why? Because what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Listen to the story. John Paul II had a longtime secretary, Cardinal Jeevish. Cardinal Jeevish was in the room with John Paul II as he lay dying. And as he was there in the room on April 2nd in the evening of 2005, he felt an imperative speak to his heart that said, celebrate Mass now. And Cardinal Jeevish obeyed. He set up for Mass and he noticed it was into the evening. In fact, it was into the night. So as he was setting up for Mass, what happens when you go to, ma can you go to Mass for Sunday on Saturday night? Yeah, it's called the Vigil Mass, right? He looked, it was Saturday night. He opened up and he set up for Mass for the Vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. He celebrated the Mass. John Paul II was able to receive the Eucharist through a droplet of the precious blood, and less than an hour later, he went to his eternal reward. Amazing. In, in fact, Pope Benedict XVI later said, that was divine providence. I mean, if that's not divine providence, I don't know what is. But he said, John Paul, divine providence, ordered things so that he would go to his eternal reward in the arms of mercy, on the very vigil of the feast that for him, when he established it, was the happiest day of his life. So when that happened, when he died that day, I remember calling my sister Heather, and I said, Heather, the second greatest story in the history of the world just ended. And I told her all this stuff about the details that, I, that were coming out. And she was like, wow. And I was like, wow. I said, Heather, I want to dedicate my life to making known this message. This is so amazing. Now, it is a pretty amazing story, right? Now, but the good news is it gets even better. Because listen to this. John Paul II died April 2nd, 2005. The next day was Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, he had actually prepared an address for Divine Mercy Sunday that he couldn't deliver because he died. But they had the address, and a cardinal delivered it. Now, I want to read to you what John Paul's last words were. He says, As a gift to humanity, which sometimes seems bewildered and overwhelmed by the power of evil, selfishness, and fear, the risen Lord offers his love that pardons, reconciles, and reopens hearts to love. That's merciful love. It is a love that converts hearts and gives peace. How much the world needs to understand and accept divine mercy. Lord, we believe in you and confidently repeat to you today, Jesus, I trust in you. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. When I read that, I was thinking about what a perfect bookend. John Paul II's pontificate began in his first homily with the words, Be not afraid. And then he ends, Jesus, I trust in you. Two sides of the same coin. That's the heart of the message of divine mercy, that Jesus is coming to us with the rays of his mercy, and he just wants us to turn from sin and accept his mercy, to trust in his mercy. Now, with that, I thought, okay, this is enough. This is the best story, greatest story ever told. But you know where I'm going. It gets even better. And I realized that it gets even better. I thought that was the end. I realized it gets even better last summer. But before I tell the story about how it gets even better, I want to first tell a little bit of, of a personal story that I think will provide some of the context for this. Okay, that story uh, begins my freshman year in college. My freshman year of college, I was really fired up. I wanted to become a saint. I had some great priests at my home parish who were always talking about the meaning of life is to become a saint. And I was really on fire to become a saint, but I tried to, I would read the lives of the saints and I would try to imitate them and I just couldn't hack it. I would read John Vianney, right? And this was the guy who would, he couldn't sleep at night. Why? Because he's busy wrestling with the devil, right? He's li he eats, all he eats is rotten potatoes. I'm like, I can't keep up with these guys. And so I was, I was starting to like, my desires to be a saint were starting to peter out. 
But then I remember a friend of mine that semester gave me a book with a beautiful image of Mary's face in the cover. He said, Gately, you gotta read this thing. And I said, I don't have time to read this thing. I got too many classes and books to read as it is. But he gave me the book anyway. And I took the book to my room and I flipped it over and on the back, the book was called True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. And on the back it said, according to St. Louis de Montfort, Marian consecration, which is a particular form of devotion to Mary, is the quickest, easiest, surest, most perfect way to holiness. The quickest, easiest, most perfect way to become a saint, in other words. I said, that's what I need. <laughs> now, obviously it's not outside of the sacraments and the mass, you know, out within the sacramental context of the church, Marian consecration is a huge gift. And I thought, I gotta have this. So I read through the book. I read that book, True Devotion to Mary. And it said, if you want to really be devoted to Mary and trust your life to her, she'll lead you to Jesus. And uh, you do a 33-day preparation for that. And so I ran this 33-day preparation that had all these long litanies and prayers that grew each week. And it's hard for me to sit still. So it was a real, uh, it was like a 33-day prayer marathon for me. But I finished on December 8th. I made the consecration and everything changed. Mary really took over. It was awesome. Before that, that semester, I'd sort of I'd just been sort of chasing the girls around campus. And I stopped that. I started focusing on my vocation. And I was like, I felt called, maybe that God was calling me to be a priest. So I started, I went into what I call monk mode, where all I would do is, um, I wouldn't hang out with my friends and all that stuff. And I would just study and read and pray. And I was in monk mode. And it was great. It was great because I felt this wonderful, sweet, maternal presence of Mary, and she was leading me along the way. There was only one blip on the screen during this monk mode period, and that was when some of my friends at, at school, I could hear them starting to talk about, they, they were talking about this new French exchange student who had just come to campus. Her name was Blanche. <laughs> I called her Blanche, she didn't like that. Blanche. <laughs> and I said, okay. Uh, but I thought, I'm in monk mode, forget about it. Well, then one day I went to the cafeteria and I ran into Blanche and I forgot all about monk mode. <laughs> and I, I went right up, I said, hi, my name is Michael Gately. <laughs> and uh, it was great, but as I was talking with her, the more I was talking to her, looking at her, I thought, she is so far out of my league, forget about it. <laughs> so I went back into monk mode and everything was fine. But that semester, I had this great job that, that facilitated my monk mode style of life because I started at the athletic facility very early in the morning when nobody would work out and I could just read and pray. It was wonderful. But one of the days, one of the first people to come to the gym was Blanche. And she said, oh, Michael. I said, hello, Blanche. She said, did you have breakfast yet? And I said, well, no, I'm going to have some when I get off work. And she said, oh, you poor thing. And, I th and then she went in and I thought, wow, that was really nice versus, you know, nice, compassionate person. Okay, that was that. The next week, she showed up again. She said, oh, did you have breakfast? I said, um, no, you know, I'll have breakfast later. She said, oh, and she pulled out a brown bag. She said, I made you breakfast. And I thought, wow, that's pretty nice. And I thought, I wonder if she likes me. <laughs> and uh, so I was starting to forget about monk mode for a bit. And then, and the next week, she brought me a brown bag again. I thought, nah, she was too far out of my league. Forget about it. Well, then sometime later, I ran into Blanche on campus and she said, oh, Michael, can I speak with you? I said, sure. So we went and we sat down and, and we're talking and she said, well, I, I wanted to talk to you. I just wanted to tell you, I can't sleep, I can't eat, and I can't concentrate in my classes because I'm in love with you. And I said, okay, well, Blanche, let's take it slow. <laughs> and. Uh, we were at a very Catholic school, so we would start going on dates, and the way we would go on dates there is you basically just go for rosary walks. I think we held hands once. And, and uh, so while we were dating, I, I was starting to feel, I think, the fruits of my consecration. Or I think Mary was reminding me, Michael, you have a vocation. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. But I went up.